Okay, yeah. Uh, Richard. Yeah. Best case scenario. Yeah. What do you wish for the... Well, I'm thing? really hoping this will establish me as a child prodigy. You know, as a as a enfant terrible, you know, because I've I've wanted to be one for oh, about 65 years now, and this is my my maybe my last chance to become uh, a, a really serious uh, make a splash as a child star. Um, <clears throat> double vinyl album. That would be cool. Yeah, if we can sell. Them. 30 copies. 30, 30 million copies? 30 million copies, yep, 30 copies. Somewhere a figure between those two. I'd like to be the, the best um, new millennium beatnix type band. In yeah, in Hamilton. I'd like to kick an Auckland New Millennium Beatniks type band's ass. Yeah. World tour. <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody big time will get a hold of the video because of the skill of, of the filmmakers and, um, and, and catapult me to the point where uh, the band is actually uh, doing two week cruises on cruise ships. You would have to pay me a large sum of money. Of course. That would sound, that would be great. I'd love that. <laughs> as long as I wasn't in the engine room. No, I don't like boats or flying. No. But we get to travel, because I do like traveling. I'd quite like to I only like day trips. I'd have to take some plants with me though. Definitely. Yes, I think um, the cruise ship audience would be Richard's ideal target audience. You know, just hit those cruises with the truth. It depends what kind of cruise ship it is and where it's going. I think there are cruise ships in the world on which they would be very appropriate. The sort of cruise ships that, you know, go to Syria or the outer, outer part of the Antarctica, you know one-way trips basically you know they say they're, they're, they're germ factories but uh, I've also been told that there's a lot of easy sex to be had on cruise ships and, and uh, that, that, that's important to me I would just go on for the cruise and um, the, group, to see exact the, the groupies would just have to you know the groupies sorry but you know, go see Richard. Go see the guy with the microphone. <clears throat> that never happened, man. That <clears throat> never happened. They just made Didn't that, happen. They made that shit up. They made that shit up. Yeah, I'm trying to erase that image from my head. How did I come to join the band? I don't know. How did I come to join the band? Sure, I don't remember. I think Martin was unavailable one time, and uh, I think someone that knows Richard kn knew that I played double bass as well, so they called me to come play double bass with Richard one night. At the uh, Biddy Mulligans, that was probably about three years ago, th something like that. About three years ago. Um, after much resistance, um, I ref I didn't want to go to any rehearsals or have to worry about pre-performance tension too much. So uh, Richard said I can just show up, play whatever. They had it all ready for me, so I just get to walk on stage, and it's there ready. And if I don't like the poem. The content in the poem, I'll just just walk off, just leave. Okay. And they're cool with that. What about you? I think I was born a beatnik. 
Damn, girl. It just happened. Um, I came, I was invited to play for one of their gigs um, that was um, um, uh, in the local Garden Square protesting about the Trans-Pacific Partnership thing. And um, I thought, oh yeah, 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 I, you know, I, I, um, I'm opposed to that. And uh, if I can support it, then yeah, let's do it. So I thought it was just going to be a one-off, but um, I somehow got seconded and have done quite a few gigs and enjoyed them. Um, actually, I saw them playing at um, Droid's party. And I was like, oh, I'd love to jam with you guys. And um, I knew Chelsea, and I knew Martin, kind of. And Richard would have this huge spiel about how Martin's really picky. And he was yeah. like, oh, no, 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 no. He only likes, like, brilliant musicians. Like, I like his stuff, but I have to talk to him, and it is this huge thing about it. And then, like, a little while later, I got a Facebook message, and he was like, oh, Martin was actually really, really overexcited to play with you. And I was like, yes. So... Apparently my style works. Yeah. Um, which is basically weird noises on the violin. So. And Martin is the most fun person to play music with in the entire world ever. Oh, I came to New Zealand in '88. Uh, well, my first my first thing was I had to get the fuck out of the United States because I really hate the United States. And I hated living there, and I hated the culture and the dominant culture. I mean, I had some friends and all that, and uh, but I hated the dominant culture. And I hated all the bullshit and all the redneck crap, and uh, and uh, I didn't feel like they had this thing back then, you know, about America, you know, love it or leave it, you know. Well, I didn't love it, so I left it. And uh, I, 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 I would, this is before Google, so I actually had to do some work to uh, research where I wanted to go to. The first choice was to leave Texas, you know, and. Uh, and the next choice was where, and uh, I, I did the research. And New Zealand seemed to be by the process of elimination, you know, uh, English speaking because I was too old and my Spanish wasn't good enough. Uh, so English speaking in Canada is too cold, and uh, I went to Jamaica, but I didn't want to be somebody with a, with a middle class income in a place where so many people are so fucking poor, you know. And uh, Australia struck me as being like too much like fucking Texas. And so uh, New Zealand was sort of like process of elimination, what was left. When did the band get together? It wasn't, a band hasn't got together. Uh, about five or six years ago, it struck me that, well, see, I always wanted to be a beatnik when I grew up. You know, that's why the name of the group, Beatniks, you know. And uh, back back when I was wanting to be a beatnik, it was back when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, you know. What's a beatnik? Oh, that was a member of the beat generation. That preceded the hippies. I had a completely different ethos. And it's sort of like in this sort of situation, take too long to explain it, but you can Google it, I guess, you know. Uh, but I, I wanted to be a beatnik, which was like, you know, a, a countercultural, uh, you know, non uh, conformist, uh, but it was before the hippies. The beatniks were worried that dark, somber clothes and a bad attitude rather than, oh, wow, sunshine and light, peace and love, you know. Uh, beatniks were more like, oh, fuck. So I, I, and there was pictures of beatniks, there was were berets, and, and they played bongo drums, you know. Now, Jack, <clears throat> Mr. Kerouac, what I want to ask is this. To what extent do you believe that the beat generation is related to the, to the hippies? Oh, what, just, what the hippies are good kids, they're better than the beat. The beats, uh, see, Ginsburg and I, and, well, Ginsburg. We're 40, we're all in our 40s, mm -hmm. and we started this, and the kids took it up and everything. And, but uh, a lot of hoods, hoodlums, and uh, communists jumped on our backs. Mm -hmm. I discovered when I was 14, uh, when I got my beret, that I'm so badly allergic to wool that I couldn't wear a fucking beret. But I decided, well, you know, maybe you don't really need a beret, you know. So, uh, anyhow, so... Uh, Anyhow, they were always reading their 
they're, they're beatnik poetry to somebody playing a bongo drum. Well, I, I was shit at the bongo drum too. So I couldn't wear a beret and I couldn't play a bongo drum. But uh, when I started uh, writing stuff again uh, and performing stuff again in, in you know, venues that they call poetry that usually mostly aren't, uh, it struck me that, uh, that if I'm going to be a beatnik, I need somebody playing the bongo drums with me. But I didn't know anybody who played the bongo drums, so I started suggesting it to Martin that he play his double bass with me. And he thought that was a good idea, so he started playing the double bass. And then gradually, that was about uh, five or six years ago, I guess. And then gradually, that would be about like 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. And uh, gradually over time, more people joined up. But it's changed. Well, for a while there, we had a cello, and we had someone who played homemade guitar, and uh, we had various people come and go. But the, the current group uh, seems to be, uh, ever since Lot joined in, and uh, I mean, he, he's pretty much committed to the group. And Chris seems to be pretty much the group. I mean, they both play in a lot of other bands too, but they like playing with this for some fucking reason, I don't know. And, um, and Lot and Chris, and uh, Chelsea's really keen, uh, although she's got a kid, she goes to school, she has a job, so that limits her participation. And, and Michaela, for some reason, she thinks it's really cool. I mean, it's sort of cool with Michaela because the rest of us, you know, here I am, you know, pushing Stephanie with my gray beard. And there's Martin, who may be 15 years younger than me, but he looks like he could be my father with his long white beard, you know. And there's Lot with his goatee that's white and about this long, you know. There's all these old beatniks, you know. And then there's Michaela, this this pixie who's about one third my age. She's like 23, you know. And how much is that? Oh, she's a kick-ass violin player. She really adds a lot to the, to the band. So yeah, I think I think that makes a good visual contrast. You know? The way we do the music is yeah, listen to the words. What are these poems about? If you can get, well, some kind of idea, a mood, just make some notes. This Could one's angry, this one's about capitalism, this one's about whatever, this one's kind of dark, maybe this one might be... Well, for me it's very simple. Um, I uh, would prefer not to even think about it until it's happening. It just—it's just something that that happens as as it's happening. He's always writing new material. Um, I've most of the time never heard it until he's on stage talking about it, or it's coming out of his mouth, and 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 uh, the performers, the musical performers, are, are reacting to it. And. Uh, that's that's just what keeps it fresh, really, for me. Fresh and fun and challenging. Very spontaneous. <laughs> it's, a, it's like an improv soundtrack. It just works. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, if I hate it, I just... You can, you can kind of fuck with his words if you want, and that's why it's fun. Mm. Mm. Hey. Yeah, I like the chaos. Um, okay, so Richard starts talking at the first couple of words he says. Um, we kind of get a mood and just start playing whatever um, happens and um, try to fit in with the, the um, flavour of the moment, I guess. I'm listening to Richard, but I'm trying. I'm trying to listen to, you know, we basically get a a soup of um, sound going, and I just try to um, add a flavour to that soup. Uh, so there's um, there's some pre-meditation, but uh, mostly um, mostly just reacting with your little flavour to whatever's going on. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's totally wrong. Yeah. I'm used to hanging out with smelly old men. <laughs> Chelsea's good at managing them actually. She's, she's got the style. I don't do anything that I don't want to do. Yeah. And Richard's cool with that. He says he likes my shit. So, you know, if I just want to turn up and just hang out and be grumpy and spaz out on the guitar and smash things, he, he kind of, I think that's what he wants from me. You, you fit right in when you do that though, don't you? 
I don't know. Is it grumpy old men? Oh yeah, I've got the team. Okay. Up. Uh, um. For me, uh, it was kind of tricky. Because I knew it was always going to be, if anyone ever heard what the words were, it was going to be controversial. If there were people listening, that this could, this is potentially offensive to people. But at the same time, we'd actually, we'd actually gone through the set probably shit two or three times, like just not playing any music, but I, I knew the poems and the particular one in question, yeah. Well, for me, no. I, I think that if, uh, if uh, someone is, uh, is uh, coming out on an evening to hear some, uh, some music, especially um, uh, some improvised music uh, to, to poetry, you should be expecting anything, really. I had a problem with the vagina fluid um, poem. I don't think I've heard that one. Um, but and I told him that I didn't want him to perform. I said I wouldn't perform that, and I didn't want him to do that song. And he told me not to be a fucking bully. But that's about the biggest fight that Richard and I have had. So I just kind of let it go. And then he still did play that song, but I just walked off the stage and then came back on afterwards. No, I can actually say I have never, ever had any complaints about the content of what they do. No, strictly complaints about how difficult they are to manage. There's no theme that you might say, but there's something that it all has in common. And that uh, I always try to tell some truth. I, I, I like committed to telling the truth, whatever it is I'm going after. I don't know what truth is, but he's, he's being straight up when he says this is... His truth. So, yeah. I think everyone has their own truth. I think that's yeah. The, the truth is not a lie. <laughs> is that accurate? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, whatever Richard Salenkoff um, <laughs> is saying at the time, <laughs> you know, wh whatever he's feeling, pretty much, um, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, it's a funny one. His, you know, he's a, he's an opinionated cat, and good on him. I'm like I'm like an old uh, has been opponent heavyweight who comes in chin first, slugging at the body. You know, that, that sort of truth, you know, it's, it's the truth of the body puncher. Well, there was that time that they played uh, at a solstice party at my house, actually. Uh, as usual, I didn't invite them, they demanded to be on the schedule. Um, and as usual, I allowed for this. However, I believe Richard was late. Uh, they were supposed to be the first act. They were on in the lounge. Um, can't, imagine, can't remember exactly what happened in terms of trying to get them there. Uh, well, Rick Martin was there because it was at Martin's house. Um, but he turned up eventually, and he was quite drunk. Quite drunk, actually. Um, but the sort of drunk that was sort of ideal for the circumstances, because somehow, well, first of all, physically, every time he, did, he fell over, it didn't matter, because he fell into the couch and kind of... Well, you know, he didn't land up flat on his back. We could get him back up on his feet fairly easily. In fact, a couple of times he even got himself up by himself. Uh, but that actually worked. I mean, it kind of fitted with the general aesthetic. And, it, it, and you know, the more it happened, the more the room filled up. There were other rooms, other things going on at the party. But as the word got on that there was this guy in the lounge and he was telling the truth and falling over, the better it was. What's a quaggy doodle? Oh, well... That this is Pocky Doodle. <laughs> Only C.
seen in paintings, frozen in time, Quacky Doodle doesn't rest, perpetually playing out the role of being continuously and simultaneously both dangerous and endangered, and threatening and threatened. Some may consider Quacky Doodle to be sacred, despite being imaginary. Sort of like God. No need to pray for Quacky Doodle, however, it's culturally appropriate to uh, sacrifice a virgin. Any present? <laughs> So that part of our recent national call celeb didn't make me feel threatened at all. What did strike me, and I do mean strike me, with unresolved outrage deep down in my soul, was the part about horsing around. Just horsing around. A bit of banter. These are variations on the mantra of self-justification spewed out by bullies everywhere with unconvincing displays of injured innocence with just a touch of nobility. I had enormous fun using my superior power to torment you, you lesser being. Which makes it okay because, well, I had so much fun. What's the matter? Can't you take a bit of fooling around? A bit of teasing? Can't you take a joke? Sheesh. It doesn't matter if it was only fun for the bully and not for his or her victim because the bully matters and the victim doesn't. Bullies are the source of all evil on earth. This is personal. A note to my sibling. You've never convinced, you've never conceived of me, brother, on an interactive level as anything other than a thing. For you to have a jolly time tormenting. It doesn't matter to me that you can justify it to yourself as just brotherly kidding around because it wasn't. It doesn't matter to me that it's the result of conditioning that you acquired by following the cues of our inhuman horror of a mother that she gave you as a birthright. Our radically different upbringings in the same house mean that I see the way we were and are in a manner that your self-centered, malicious mind can't imagine. Thing real personal. <laughs> a failure of imagination. I saw a screenshot on Facebook of a Twitter message that someone had sent to a sapphic singer saying, I stopped listening to your music when I found out, lowercase you, we're a Lebanese. God, woman, man, with woman. Seeking empathy, I try to imagine what it would be like to be that human. But it was beyond me. <laughs> Anyhow, I don't see what's wrong with being Lebanese. Hazard Belmont was a pretty good league player, and he was Lebanese. <laughs> Okay, just the uh, forewarning. When I went through this earlier, both uh, Chris and Martin gave me weird looks when I was finished with it. And I have to tell you that it means absolutely nothing. It's something I jotted down when I woke up from a dream. So it's just silly nonsense. Don't try to read any meaning into it because there is any. No, Johnny Frog. No, no, no. Gina. 
raucousness from elsewhere in the suburb and the city stirs up the spirits in their godlike nastiness, then subsides into the air like dream magic. Back burner. 
as she stood beside me whilst I did this, I took the opportunity to grope her cloak and her axe. She implored me, matter of factly, that she'd been waiting all her life for someone who didn't put her on a pedestal and would casually grope her ass in the kitchen. I don't know why I was so spaced out that morning, but I left the dog exercise park on a day characterized by a disturbed westerly flow, having forgotten to take my umbrella with me. Although the sky was blue though when we left the car, I knew that our chances of a dry, full-length ramble were slim. And sure enough, a half an hour later, as we were crossing the lawn toward the stick tree, I felt a gust of wind in my back, turned and saw a mass of black clouds approaching rapidly from the southwest. Without hesitation, I started striding briskly back toward the car directly, the fox terrier following. It started spinning as I descended the ramp past the boathouse and then began pissing down for real after I'd strode maybe 20 meters along the riverside footpath. I ran through the rain with a clumsy, thudding, lumbering gait for the last 80 meters or so to the northern landing car park at the shelter of my funky old floor. It was the first time I had run in years. <laughs> Obvious strategy. It was mid-afternoon in mid-spring. The weather outside was pleasant, and my front door was open. The first fly of the season zipped in but my pyrethrum spray convinced him to depart. <coughs> I was less than halfway through my first bottle of wine for the day, when my loneliness overtook me, making me shudder and sweat. The obvious strategy for addressing this involved concentration upon drinking, not thinking. Thank you. <laughs>